altar, put those hands together for Jesus. Come on, if you know Jesus is worthy of all the praise and glory, if you know ain't nobody like Jesus, open up your mouth and give Jesus some praise. If he's ever healed your body, if he's ever touched your mind, if he's ever restored something back that you thought was lost, come on, somebody give Jesus some praise in the room. Just so you know, praise is not an act of sovereignty. God doesn't make you praise him. If he had to make you praise him, it wouldn't be praise. Rather, worship and praise is an act of the will. That's why David said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continuously be in my mouth. That's why David said, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I, I will. Come on, I will. I want you to take about 15 seconds in this room and get a will. Praise up out of your soul and tell your flesh tell your situation tell your circumstance uh, today i will bless the lord today i will praise him come on you got 10 seconds open up your mouth in this room i will bless the lord well i don't know about you but i am excited to be at church today Anybody excited to be here today? Are you excited? Come on, I said, are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? I, 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 grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. I feel like preaching today. I feel one of them old school, sweaty, Holy Ghost preachers coming on me. And I hope you came ready to receive something from God today. I want to acknowledge something before I acknowledge your pastor and the staff. Uh, but about a week ago, those of us who are in the faith and call ourselves believers uh, stood horrified, grieved at what was supposed to be a performance at the Grammys turn into a demonic, satanic ritual. And you, let's just call it what it is. That's what it was. But here's what I've learned about the devil. He has a tendency to overplay his hand always. And what the enemy tried to do was try to make God's people seem like God's people were losing and that God was on the, come on, on the retreat and that the enemy was taking ground. But I've learned this about the devil. He's full of pride. So even when he's losing, he tries to make it seem like he's winning. Because what none of us knew after the Grammys was that in As, come on, Asbury, Cal uh, Kentucky, a group of young people would gather for convocation. I don't know if you've been seeing this. But they have been in straight revival going on four and a half days, five days now. Thousands of people are gathering. The Spirit of God is moving. People are being saved. People are being healed. People are being delivered. What am I trying to tell you? Don't let the enemy fool you. Revival is not coming. The winds of revival are blowing in the United States of America. And I came to tell the devil, you better back up, devil. Revival is here to stay, and I believe revival is here at Kingdom Culture. Is there anybody believe that we are standing on the threshold of a mighty move of God? Somebody who believes it, give God some praise and let God know that revival. Revival's about to make a pit stop in Orlando. Revival's about to make a pit stop in your house, in your family. So don't let him fool you today. He's losing, and he's losing a lot quickly. I feel like preaching. Okay. How many thank God for your pastors? You love Pastors Jeremy and Missy? He's right. We, he and I were talking. 
It has been almost a decade since the first time I preached a kingdom culture. Back then, it wasn't even kingdom culture. It was sea life. And we were meeting in this little auditorium at Chain of Lakes Middle School. How many were there? Yeah, about 40, y'all. That's right. That's what it was. Back all that. But look what the Lord has done. And if you're thinking about any other church, in it, I wouldn't leave because God has got his hand on this place with these leaders and these pastors. Well, I feel like preaching. I got my wife and my daughter here today somewhere. Uh, I'm thankful for them. I preach better and shorter. Uh, that's a lie. I don't preach shorter. Come on, somebody. Uh, but I feel the Lord in this place. Acts chapter 12. I see so many familiar faces this morning. I feel the Lord. Can, can I just preach like I'm with family today? I just want to preach it like I feel it. God's been speaking to me. Acts chapter 12. If, if you didn't read your Bible all week, we're going to read it today. 11 verses. And God's going to speak to us. This is what the word of the Lord would say. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, Peter, he put him, Peter, in prison and delivered him, Peter, to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards were at the door keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself up now, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. Where they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Watch this last verse. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and that he has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. I want to preach for just a moment. I had no idea that revival would be breaking out all across the country this Sunday when God gave me this word for you. But God told me to preach at Kingdom Culture. He said, Josh, preach, give me revival and give us an awakening. Let me pray and I'll preach. Father, I thank you for what I sense and what I feel. Father, I pray, speak by your spirit on this day. Lord, let our hearts and minds and ears be open to what the Spirit is saying in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, say amen. You can be seated, and as you're seated, just look at somebody and say, give me revival. Yeah, give me revival. The text that I bring before you today is a text that, lay, that lays in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is widely known with the subtitle, Acts of the Apostles. However, it is more rightly should have been in the subtitle, Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Because all that we do for the kingdom, we don't do by ourselves. We do because we are empowered by the Holy Ghost. Lasting impact is only happening, only happens when that which is from the Spirit invades our lives and goes through us to somebody else. But the text that I bring before you is a text that centers around the early church. That while the Holy Spirit is moving in the church, the church in those days was not the church like you see it today. The church was small. The church didn't have much size. They weren't even called the church. In fact, the Bible is very clear and history would tell us that they didn't even call them Christians till Antioch. The church was called the people of the way. So when I speak out of Acts 12, I'm not speaking to you of the mega church in which you sit in this moment. For you do understand that if it had not been for them, there would be no you. Oh, come on, somebody. 
I said, if it had not been for that church, there could not be this church. Because here's what I want you to understand at the onset and the introduction of my message is that when I bring Acts 12 before you, I am bringing the church in its infancy. But even though the church is in its infancy, it does not lack potency. Never confuse size with significance. Oh, come on, somebody. I said never confuse size with significance. I know that our theology would tell you that God is big. And how many in this room can testify that God is a big God? Oh, come on, somebody, talk to me. I said, how many can testify you know God is big? Uh, because God is bigger than cancer. He's bigger than issues. He's bigger than diseases. He is the God above every other God with a name that is above every other name. Don't you dare let the devil trick you or ever lie to you and tell you that God is small. God it will never be small. God he is a big God. Our theology would demand that God is a big God, but God has a way. Though he is big, he is not afraid to jump in something that's small. Oh. That's for every person in the room that is new in their faith. Or maybe you've just started an endeavor. Or maybe you're just responding to a call. And maybe you're sitting in the room this morning and you feel like you have a little anointing. Or a little gift. Or a little calling. I came to tell you, don't despise the day of small beginnings because if you want to know where God starts God starts in your small beginning God starts with little gifts and little anointings and he starts with shepherd boys y'all ain't saying nothing and he starts with little kings and he starts with the little stuff why because God ever knows that if you give him your little thing he's a big God and if you give little stuff to a big God it won't be long before little stuff becomes big stuff. Uh, let me show you what I mean. It's always an acorn before it's an oak tree. It's always five loaves and two fish before it feeds a multitude. It's always, come on, one son before it's many sons. It's always uh, faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed before it moves a mountain. It's always 12 before it's a church. Uh, and it's always 120 before it turns into a global awakening. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to stir your faith uh, to understand that you might be in a day where it's just a little bit. But if it's a little bit with God, it's about to be something significant that shakes the foundation foundations of hell. I wish I had somebody in the room who would testify and say, God, I might not have much, but what I have, I'm giving it to you. Why? Because if it ever gets in your hands, it's about to be something I've never seen or fathomed. God, here's my little, make it what you want it to be. The church was small in size, but it did not lack authority. It was small in size, and it didn't lack power. It had small structure, but it had a big God. And the church moved forward with one calling and one calling alone. That though it was small, it was still called to change the world. Do you know that everything God gives people has the capacity to change the world? Come on, y'all. See, 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 I can tell some of y'all have bought the lie of the enemy because you still believe that your little thing can't do much. But anything God gives you has the capacity to change the world. I'm going to say it till you believe it. Any, any, any little small singing gift or business gift, it has the capacity. If God puts it in your hands, it has the capacity to change the world. It has the capacity to make the kind of impact uh, that shifts, come on, shifts cultures uh, and changes businesses and moves families and heals bodies. If it ever comes from God, it has enough to do the job. Do you, you know why some of us don't believe that and why we didn't go lose our mind praising God? It's because we have bought into another lie. Can I preach just a little bit? Can I preach? Can I preach? Because we have told you in this social media, TikTok, Instagram world that the height of leadership is influence. We have taught you that the height of what you do is to influence stuff. So we go for followers... And we go to be viral, but we don't. We want to be viral, but we don't want to change anything. 
What if I told you in the kingdom, I am a kingdom culture, that the height of leadership and the apex of faith is not influence, it's impact. And there's a difference because whatever God puts in your hands, by the time God is done with it, he wants you to hit something so hard that by the time you're done with it, there is a mark that cannot be removed. Y'all ain't saying nothing. By the time God gives you something and you hit something, by the time you're finished, they have to say, that's where so-and-so was. And that's where so-and-so was. God, give us a people and a church that makes the kind of dent that all of Orlando says, look at that kingdom culture church. Those are the kind of people that are changing the world. Look at somebody say, hit it. Yeah, look at somebody say, hit it. Yeah, with your gift, hit it. With your anointing, hit it. With whatever God has put on the inside, hit it. Hit it. I don't care what the devil said about it. I don't care what the culture is saying. You don't have time to sit back and see if it's going to work out. If God be for you, what can be against you? And no weapon formed against you is about to prosper. you got one life and one gift and one anointing. Take your punch, throw your haymaker, and make a difference before you go to heaven. Am I preaching to anybody? Oh, somebody ought to give got some praise yeah you gotta hit it in the early church said we're small but we pack a punch everywhere we go everywhere we go blind people see oh y'all ain't saying nothing everywhere we go the lame get up and walk you get around us too long we might not be many but there's some dead people that'll get up if you hang around us too long if you hang around us too long you're gonna hear the gospel of jesus if, if you hang around us too long you might even have you might even be possessed or oppressed but if you hang around us by the time we're done, you're going to be set free because who the sun sets free is free indeed. God, get us back to being the kind of people that throw our punch. And they were called to change the world. Notice I did not say, be like the world. I don't have to come back next week, so I'm going to preach it. Because the church is never called to be part of culture. We are called to be counterculture. See, there's got to be some people in the room that still know how to draw a line in the sand. Maybe I'll preach over here. Because I feel like there's some mamas over here and some daddies over here that have made up their mind and said, as for me and my house, I don't care about nobody else's house. I don't care about the world's. I don't care about your buddy's house. As for me and my house, we ain't going to go everywhere everybody else goes or do everything everybody else does. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We made up our minds. Come hell or high water, this thing is for real. And give me Jesus or take my life. We are called to be a counterculture. I remember a day, I remember a day, Natasha, I remember a day, I remember a day that when Christians walked in a room, the room changed, not the Christian. I remember a day when, when believers would get in a room, they carried such an atmosphere of heaven. I wish I had somebody that when they walked in, they might have been cussing, but they stopped cussing. Oh, don't be religious on me. I remember a day when my grandfather would walk into a room so full of the Holy Ghost. People were all cracked and all crazy, telling dirty jokes. And by the end of it, they say, will you pray with me? Because there ought to be a marked difference in your life. Uh, there ought to be something about your life that when you come in the room, they might be going through something crazy. But all of a sudden, when you show up, they feel peace that passes all understanding Uh, when you show up they feel joy unspeakable and full of glory where are the believers in the room that say i don't care if you make fun of me or not you can call me a holy roller you can call me crazy i just know i've tasted from a well that never runs dry and my life has been changed if i've got any believers in the room like that make some noise to let everybody else around you know That's why I don't like a quiet church. Uh, I said, I don't like a quiet church. 
because there's always somebody in the room trying to figure out if this thing is real or not. There's always somebody in the room trying to figure out, can they find what they're looking for? That's why you can't sit there on your row and act like God ain't never done nothing for you. That's why this room needs some crazy praisers and some wild worshipers who say, if you're trying to figure out if God can, if you're trying to figure out if God can do it for you, give me 30 seconds and I'll show you somebody in the room worship like you've lost your mind and testify. And all the religious people got real mad right there. But can I tell you, religious person in the room who said, it's too much. You're too loud. Let me tell you, that's why God keeps sitting the crazy worshiper next to you. He's sitting them next to you. Why? Because he's trying to tell you, you either got to level up or level out. <laughs> Y'all, come on. Oh, God. You got to level up or level out. Uh, I wonder if there's anybody in the room. I feel the roof about to come off this thing. That would take about 10 seconds and let's level up. Uh, somebody's jump up on your feet and give God the best praise you've given him all morning long. Shout in the room. Level up. Level up, level up, level up. And while you're leveling up, glory's coming down. Anointing's coming down. Fire's coming down. As you go up, the blessings. Woo, be seated. Hey. 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 What if I told you your calling is not in your comfort zone? What if I told you that everything God has prepared for you is outside of what you call comfort? If you needed a comfort zone to do it, then why would the Holy Ghost be a comforter? The Holy Ghost is waiting for somebody to step out of what you know into something you've never done so that he can see his power in your life. Preach the text, Josh. Y'all feel that in this room? And so the early church decided we ain't going to be like the world. We're going to come out from among them and be separate enough to affect what we came out of. What if I told you that oftentimes your ministry assignment is tied to what God brought you out of? Part of your anointing is tied to what the enemy called chains and bondage. And so the early church said, we can't do what we do without the power of the Holy Ghost. If we are going to affect the world, we can only affect the world with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you this. The mark of a church in revival is when a church wants nothing more than to pursue the things of the Spirit. Yeah, it's not weird and we don't hide it. You do know it. You're a kingdom culture. We don't hide the Holy Ghost. We don't put him in a back room for Thursday nights and then let him loose and then put him back in his cage. You understand that you're in a room this morning that he can have his way whenever he wants to. Whenever he's done with the message, he's done with the message. Whenever he's done with worship, he's done. But I want to let you know you can't affect the world if you don't have Holy Ghost power. And if you're not pursuing it, you won't ever have it. God likes to drop it off along the way to you. So the book of Acts then is a book where God first shows us in Acts 2 that he will empower his church before he releases his church to make a difference. And you do know that this dunamis explosion, thank you, bro, that this dunamis explosion of Acts 2, the dunamis, the Holy Ghost Pentecostal moment of Acts 2, you know that when that moment hit the church, it didn't stay in the upper room it began to spill out. Talk to me, somebody. It began to spill out into every section of life, humanity, government, and religion. Because that's how I know if you're really full of the Spirit. In fact, let me go real deep. I'll be deep on a Sunday. I always know what you're really full of by what you overflow with. Because I've known a lot of people that'll speak in tongues on Sunday 
and be mean as a snake to the waitress at the restaurant right after the service. I know some people that know how to shout, dance, they know all the church stuff, but they don't know how to treat their neighbor or be nice in a drive through Y'all ain't saying nothing. I was watching. Let me show you what I mean. I, I, I'm not on TikTok, but somebody sent me a TikTok. Come on, Gen Z, where you at? I got a TikTok the other day. I, I, don't, I don't have one, but they sent me the TikTok. I opened it, and it was a water challenge. And what they had was this cup of water, and the cup looked full. And the challenge was is that they poured more water in what looked full to see how much more water it could actually hold. Because it's possible to look full and not be full. And so I watched as time and time again, they dumped a little bit of water. They dumped a little bit of water. They dumped a little. Finally, there was a boy who got up, and when he put one drop in, it sent it into overflow. What am I trying to tell you? That if you are going to claim that you are full of the Spirit, let me tell you how I know is when you overflow that Holy Ghost into every aspect of your life. Uh, that the Holy Ghost ain't just a Sunday morning thing. It ain't just a Sunday night thing. The Holy Ghost ain't just a small group thing. But the Spirit of God overflows in every conversation away with these people who say they're full of the Holy Ghost and they don't worship they don't stand they don't amen they're not moved by the devil is a liar because when this Holy Ghost fills you up he fills you to overflow and you'll trip on everything that's around you The early church was so full that everywhere they went they dripped on it they didn't have much size but they had the drip. They had drip before it was even drip. Come on, y'all. What if I told you the world's still waiting on the drip? The world's still waiting on you to go to your work. I feel like preaching now. And stand in there and say, does anybody need prayer? Does anybody need healing? Why? I got the drip. I got what you need. It ain't me, but it's the J-E-S-U-S on the inside of me. It's the Holy Ghost in my soul, in my life. Oh, where's the mamas in the room who walk up to their kids and say, I know you got a bad attitude, but in the name of Jesus. I bind confusion out of your life, uh, not by might or by power, but by spirit uh, of the living. I got the drip. Just look at somebody and say, I got the drip. Yeah, I got the drip. I got, I'm dangerous. I'm dangerous. I'm dangerous. I'm dangerous. I'm dangerous. I'm about to walk out this service dangerous. I got the drip. Lord, let me finish my introduction. And it spilled out into every sector of life. Humanity, religion, and even government to the point where contextually the government and religion, that's a, what a combo there. The government and religion said, if we don't stop this thing, it's going to take over. You do know that's what hell's been whispering the last few years? I wish I had some people with discernment. You do know that's what, it's, that's what the whisper of hell has been. That if we don't stop, shut down, lock down, come on, divide and conquer this movement, this kingdom movement is about to come out and change the world around us. We got to shut it down before it takes over. And so they said, here's what we'll do. Bring James. And the Bible said that King Herod killed James with the sword. And it pleased the people. And then he realized, since that works so well, let's go after the big dog. Go arrest Peter. Y'all ready for this? Because here's why he's going after Peter. Because Peter is the one Jesus said would be the the rock. He's the leader of the church. He's the foundational point of the local church. And the enemy won't knows that if he wants to get the church, he has to go after the leaders. Help me do it, Holy Ghost. Because when the enemy wants to attack the church, 
The first doorstep he's coming to is not yours. Please, Pastor Josh. I know you may think that that's the way it works, but if the enemy wants to crumple the local church and the global church, he's not going after you. The first thing he's going to do is try to take down some leaders. See, you don't even understand what it takes to stand up here. See how quiet it is? You don't know what I had to fight just to stand up here this morning and give you what thus saith the Lord. So pardon my passion and my craziness, but I've already won a battle before I took this pulpit. And let me tell you what most leaders won't tell you. That please don't complain about us until you've prayed for us. You don't know that oftentimes the first arrows and the first bullets from hell's, come on, hell's guns and artillery, they're fired at us. And I'll tell you what another thing that most leaders won't say is we don't mind taking the bullet as long as we know you got our back. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that some stuff never got to you because we took it. Y'all Y'all way too quiet. Maybe that's too much for a Sunday morning. You know that Pastor Jeremy was able to build this building and go through all the craziness so that you could worship with your family, get your blessings, have your miracles, but he had to get hit with stuff, but I bet he'd do it all over again if he knew that you had his back. Is there a church in the room that say, we love our leaders. We pray for our leaders. We don't, we don't tear them down. We lift them up. And he said, let me get Peter. And the Bible is clear that he got Peter. And the Bible says that he arrested Peter. Now I'm in my text. He arrested Peter and the Bible says he put four squads of soldiers around one man. One squad is four soldiers. Four squads would have been 16 soldiers around one man. Let me be deep. You want to know what you carry in the kingdom? Look at what the enemy assigns. If, if you want to know what you really got in you, look at what the enemy's putting around you. Look at the attacks that are coming against you. And that's for every person in the room that keeps getting hit with stuff. That you turn around and you get through this, but now you got to go through that. And you go through that and you got to get hit with another thing. But here's what I want the devil to know. That it's still true. That the righteous man may fall seven times. He may get hit seven times, get knocked down seven times, get pushed over seven times. But the Bible says that that man, that righteous man, he may get hit seven times, but the Bible says he gets up and he keeps on moving. I came to tell you that the Lord told me to tell somebody that the anointing that's on your life is greater than the attack against your life. And that if the enemy's been hitting you, it's only because he's scared of what's about to come out of who you are. Oh, if I got some people, why don't don't you just rub it in the devil's face and tell the devil, I'm still here. I'm still here. I still have my hands up. I'm still worshiping. I'm still serving. I'm still here. Put your 16 soldiers around me and it ain't going to stop me from loving Jesus. 16 soldiers. Can I go deeper? 16. 16 soldiers. I started thinking about 16. In the Bible, we don't hear about 16 too often. And trust me, those of us who love the Bible love numbers. Yes, we do. One, two, agreement. We like number three, Trinity talk. We like five because it's grace. Seven because it's completion. We like number eight because it's new beginnings. We like 12 because it's older. But 16? We ain't never heard nothing about no 16. So I started to study. 16. What's really happening in this text with 16? Until you realize that in the Bible, the number 16 is tied to the idea of loved or loving. Let me show you what I mean. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's located in John 3. Okay. 
1 John, the disciple who is the beloved disciple, writes the 16th reference of the word love in 1 John is this verse. Perfect love. Cast out all fear. Let me go deeper. The Apostle Paul has a whole chapter dedicated to love. He starts saying love is, love is, love is kind, love is this, love is love, love. Do you know how many times he uses the phrase love is? 16 times. And then it hit me. Maybe in this moment the enemy's not trying to shut down Peter's power. Maybe he is trying to limit Peter's love. Oh. Because what makes the church extra powerful is not how much we speak in tongues, how much we run or lay on the floor or holler or scream. Let me tell you what changes the world is when we step out of this building and we walk in such a love, such a supernatural love, where it don't matter what color you are or where you came from, all we know is that if you be in Christ, you my brother and you my sister and we walk in love together. You know what the world is waiting on? For people to believe what Jesus said. When Jesus said, they'll know your mind. They'll know your mind. By how much you love one another. Let me tell you what's about to hit the church. A revolution of love like we have never seen. God is about to set his church up to be a city on a hill. Love is about to abound. Let, let me be real deep for all you Bible people. Especially you Pentecostal Bible people. There is a move of the Spirit that you don't ever hear talk about. Because when we talk about moves of the Spirit, we're in 1 Corinthians, we're in Acts 2. We're talking about shaking, falling out, hollering, and all that's good, and I do it a lot. But one of the most underutilized, talked about moves of God is Romans 5 5. It says that the love of God would be shed abroad in the hearts of humanity, watch this, by the Holy Ghost. See, some of us in this room weren't changed because we heard a sermon. And we didn't become transformed because you liked the music. But some of you in this room can testify what changed your life is that you came weeping down to an altar and all of a sudden you encountered a love that you had never experienced. This wasn't like the love of a man or the love of a woman. This was a supernatural agape love that told you you are not what you've been through and you are not what you faced. It's the kind of love that overwhelmed you and said, go and sin no more. The kind of love that lifted you and brought you in. Is there anybody that can testify, I felt that love and there's no greater love than the love of God. The enemy will let us be powerful as long as we don't have love. Once we got our stuff together with COVID, what was the next hit to the country? Division of races. Y'all, I'll say it. I'm not scared of nobody in this room. It was like the enemy saw we were overcoming that. And then he tried to silence the church by getting us to hate one another. Because of, the, because of the color of our skin, but the devil is a liar. Jesus just ain't for one color. He's for every color of man. Come on. Man, he's for every color of woman. Every, Jesus is for every race that we have. And the body of Christ has to be the kind of people where somebody can walk in this room and see everybody. Come on. Every race demonstrated to know there is a place where it, whosoever will let them come. And so he got Peter. And the church is still in revival because the Bible says this. Even though Peter's been arrested and leadership has been undone, the Bible says that prayer was being continually offered to God by the church. Point number three, a church in revival has power. A church in revival walks in love. But if you want to know where the secret sauce of revival is, it's in the place called prayer. Now, I'm going to rock your theology right here and tell you that some of us have lied to you when we told you that the enemy is afraid of your praise. He don't care nothing about your worship. See? Look at y'all. Is that heresy? I don't know. <laughs> let, let me tell you why the enemy cares nothing about your worship. Because it's not to him. You got to remember, his sin is pride. So anything that don't puff him up, he don't care about. So your praise ain't for the enemy. It's the attraction point for God. 
God inhabits the praises of his people. So what does the enemy get afraid of if your worship doesn't do it? He gets deathly afraid when people start praying. Why? Because the moment you start praying, God starts to get involved. The moment you start praying, that which is celestial begins to invade that which is terrestrial. When you start praying, the enemy starts getting nervous because now we don't have to deal with you. He's got to deal with God. And I got news for you in the room. God has never lost a battle. I'll preach to myself. God has never lost a battle. He's undefeated, and he never will. That's good news for somebody. Maybe you ought to get off Facebook and Instagram and stop complaining and start getting down on your knees and praying and watch God start moving on your behalf. Prayer still works. And the church said, we ain't going to pray cute prayers. No lay me down to sleep prayers. We're going to pray them messy prayers. Y'all ever prayed them messy prayers? The ones where you don't even know what you're saying? You just crying and almost yelling, but you know in your heart you're saying things like, devil, you better back up off my son. The kind of prayers that says, I know I got a doctor's report, but in the name of Jesus, Father, I declare myself healed. You bore stripes on your back for my healing. Are there anybody in the room that says, I know those prayers? Uh, the ones where you're sitting at the stoplight and you're yelling and hollering and tears coming down your cheek. The one where you're laying at home and everybody says, is she okay? Is he okay? You say, I'm fine. I'm just winning on behalf of my family. Let me, let me start to land this plane. If I leave this text here, the church, though it's small and though it's under attack and though its leader has been arrested, watch this, contextually, the church is still in revival. But then I kept reading and my problem with the text started to show up because the church is praying. God is moving. But when we peer back in the prison cell, is this all right? Something tragic has happened. Peter is sleeping. And before you think, well, Pastor Josh, it's a cat nap. He's just doing what all of us do. I would tell you that's cool until you look at the Greek. Because the Greek reference here for sleeping means to slumber as if deceased. That means it got so dark and the enemy's attack got so severe that Peter decided he was going to sleep. And when he went to sleep, it looked like he was dead. Never let it be said of the church and of your life that you once looked alive. But now you look dead. Some of us, the only testimony we have is what God used to do. See how quiet it is? Some of us, the only testimony we have is times God encountered us years ago. When we were teenagers or when we were young adults. Some of us have no new history with God. And if we're not careful, even the church... I love Brownsville Revival. I'm thankful there was a Brownsville. I'm thankful to God there wasn't a Sousa Street. I'm thankful for the tent revivals of Oral Roberts and the healing revivals. I love all of it. But you, don't, you can't convince me that God's done. But maybe God's not doing it like he did it because we're asleep. Peter is asleep. Let me finish this thing. Peter, think about this. Peter is asleep. Not John, not Thomas, not, Math not, 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 Math not, not Matthias, not, not, no, no. Peter, the, the Peter who is always audacious, the Peter who's always the walk on water, the first to slice off your ear, the first to make the move. Peter, the Peter who just preached. Help me do it, Lord. Just preached the inaugural Pentecostal sermon on the day of Pentecost. That Peter has fallen asleep. And if it can happen to Peter, 
it can happen to you. Part of the enemy's attack is not to kill you. Sometimes his attack is to get you to go to sleep. And he won't do it in one moment. He'll do it over years if he has to. He will lure you into sleep. And then he'll feed you things like a critical spirit. You want to know, let me tell you how you know if you're falling asleep spiritually. Is you start to get critical of the thing that used to bless you. Now you show up to church not to touch God. You come in here to find out your next complaint to the pastors. It's too loud. I don't like that noise. They're too loud. They do this. I don't like the way you did that. My kid did that. Because if you be careful and listen, in the background, the enemy is singing you the lullaby to take you out of revival and put you to sleep. Peter is asleep. You know why theologians said Peter fell asleep? Man, this, is this good to anybody else? You give me a few more minutes. You, you know why theologians say Peter was asleep? Because after he saw James die, theologians say that Peter thought to himself, perhaps it's over. And I know you can't in this setting raise your hand, but there are people in this room. You can play soft, my brother. There are people in this room who you may not be telling it to everybody else, but you're looking at the news, you're looking at doctor's reports and family stuff, and you may not be yelling it to everybody, but you're whispering under your breath, is it over? Is it over? Because nothing around me seems to be getting better. Do you know, can I be real? I, I watched that first video from the Grammys, and secretly under my breath, I said, Lord, is it over? Have we come to the place where a news network can tweet, let's worship, and if the thing they're worshiping be demonic and our culture say, that's cool? You'd be foolish to think that some of the strongest, most anointed men were questioning everything we thought we knew about what God was doing. And some of us were even whispering, is it over? And if it's not in the church, it's in your life because the enemy has a way of coming in at just the right time when you just get the report, when the things come in, when something happens in your marriage and it'll start telling you, it's over, maybe it's over, maybe it's over, maybe it's over. And with the lullaby of it's over, he will lure you into a false sense of security and put you to sleep. Peter was saying, maybe we had a good run, but perhaps it's over. That was until... God decided to show Peter who's really in control. Because I want to prophesy over your life today and tell you, you don't have the right to determine when it's over or not. No man can tell you when it's over or not. No woman, no doctor, no report can tell you if it's over or not. The only one that has, I feel the anointing, that has the right to tell you whether it's over or not is God himself. And if God didn't say it was done, baby, you got to make sure this thing comes back to life. Because if God be for you, what can be against you? And the Bible says, God said, it ain't over. One day there'll be a place called kingdom culture. It's not over. And so the Bible said he sent angels. Sure, I feel y'all pulling on my anointing. Can I prophesy again? With all this talk of the demonic, can I put a new prophecy in the air? Here come the angels. Here come the angels. Here come the angels. Here comes supernatural reinforcement. I don't know who this is for, but you have, you have worked your own strength till you can't work it, and you don't know what to do next. God said it ain't in your strength anyway. God is about to send some angels your direction, and they are about to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Here come the angels. Just prophesy to somebody on your row and tell them. Tell them, look them in the eye and say, here come the angels. Here come the angels to your business, to your job, to your family, to your body. Here come the angels. And so the angel sent from God. 
down to Peter, steps into a cell. Watch this, y'all. He steps right in the cell past 16 soldiers. Don't miss it. Past 16 soldiers, excuse me, and stands beside Peter. And the Bible said when the angel got in position, light hit the prison. Light. There's about to be a revival of truth and light that we have never seen before. Why would God wait till it gets this dark and there's this many lies? Let me tell you why. It's because you never know the strength of the light until it's put on the backdrop of darkness. Sometimes God will let it get dark so that the light can be seen clearly. And you're going to have to have some grace for some people who are coming into the light. You, you, no, I'm going to do it. You, 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 ever, you ever been sleeping real good at night? It's real dark. And maybe your kid comes in the room, clicks that light on. And look, when you first get hit with the light, you ain't smiling. You're lying if you say you are. You make the weirdest, ugliest fake. And I know I'm saying that in the natural, but when some of your coworkers get hit with this thing, you're gonna have to give them some grace to adjust to the light. You're gonna have to give them some patience as they adjust their life and realign their life to truth. And the Bible says this angel walks up to a sleeping as if deceased Peter who is looking dead. And the text says he doesn't say holy salutations, heavenly hello. The text says he walked up to Peter, didn't shake his hand or hug his neck. The text says he hit him. Now, now you shine the light, I'm going to make a funny face. You hit me while I'm sleeping? I mean, I'm saved, but I'm saved. Come on, somebody. The angel hit Peter. Why do you hit Peter? You have to know your Greek. I'm done. It is the Greek word, potasso. And it doesn't mean to strike. The Greek word potasso means to knock. What's the angel doing? He's saying, Peter, I know you're about to give up. I'm about to close right here. I know you're about to quit. I know in your mind you think it's over. But God sent me to your life today to tell you it is not over and God is not done. In fact, Peter, the only reason I'm in this prison cell right now is to tell you, wake up, 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 wake up. And that's the word of the Lord over somebody's life. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Why? Revival is not coming. Your revival is in the building today. God sent this crazy preacher sweating, hollering, and yelling to tell you your revival isn't on the way. It's right here. It's right here. It's right here. Revival, revival, revival. Your children are about to get saved. Your body's about to be healed. Your mind is about to be renewed. The angels are saying, wake up. Get up. Get up out of depression. Get up out of anxiety. Get up out of your worry. Get up out of your fear. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up out of it. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. I can hear a knocking. I can hear the knocking. I can hear the knocking. God is saying, revival is right beside you. This is your moment. If you listen closely in your spirit, there is a knocking this morning that's telling you that despite everything you've been going through, wake up, oh ye sleeper, for your light has come. 
I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel like somebody in this room, you came in saying this is the last chance I'm giving it. But God sent me here to tell you, revival is standing right beside you telling you, watch this. Watch this. Jesus said it like this. Behold, I stand at the door and I put tasso. And if any man open up. See, you trying to make revival too hard. You trying to make it too crazy. You trying to put all this performance stuff. Let me tell you how you get a move of God in your life. Uh, all you have to do is open up uh, open up uh, open up and say god i don't care what it looks like i don't care what it feels like i don't care about my reputation i don't care what they say about me god i'm opening up why don't you take 10 seconds lift up your hands uh, open up your mouth uh, and declare give me revival give me revival give me come on don't stop uh, don't stop. You are closer than you've ever been. You are standing on the doorstep. Give me revival. Open up and so my brothers and my sisters the Bible said Peter uh, didn't lay there. The Bible said he stood up and when he stood up his chains fell off. Let me tell you what's about to happen for every person in this room that opens up. When you open up, it's going to fall off. What's going to fall off? Anxiety, depression, fear, addiction, worry. Oh, I feel the anointing. It's going to That's how easy. That's how easy. That's how easy it's going to be. You're going to stand up, and it's going to fall right off. Peter stood up. And his chains fell off. And then the angel said, hold on. Before we walk out this thing, I recognize you took some stuff off while you were slumbering that you weren't supposed to. See, some of us in the process of what we've been facing, we took off some of God's promises. We took off favor, destiny, purpose and the angel said for what I got prepared put it put it back on so not only are you going to change going to fall off but at Lord the word of the Lord over your life today is put it back on Put back your dreams. Put back the desires of your heart. Put back the anointing. Put back the ministry. Put back what God said 10 years ago. God said, put it all back on. Why? Because God is about to show you that he who has begun a good work is faithful to bring that thing to completion. Put it on. And so Peter got dressed. He put it all back on. And the angel said, follow me. And Peter's going, wait a second. Is this real or not? Because some of us don't even know that God will do some stuff in your life that's so good and so powerful and so amazing. You'll say, God, is this real? Let me show you what I mean. God has enough power to put a marriage back together overnight. God has enough power to drive cancer out of your body while you're singing a song. God has enough power to cause your unsaved son to fall on his knees and give his life to Jesus in a single moment. God can do some stuff uh, that's too good to believe. Oh, I feel faith rising. I said, I feel faith rising. Is there anybody starting to wake up and believe that God is about to do something in your life? This is it. And the Bible says he starts believing that maybe this is real. He's clothed again. No chains. And the Bible says that the angel walked him past the first guard post. And the second guard post. 
Let me tell you what that means. In former seasons, there were places you got stopped. And you got held back. And you got held up. And you got hindered. But in 2023, there will be no stopping what God is about to do in your life uh, with what's on you and God for you and be for you. You will not be held in check again. You're about to break barriers and to step into new seasons. Are you ready for revival? And he took him, final point, to the gate. I preached all that for this. He took him to a gate. Not a door, a gate. And the Bible says that when Peter got in proximity of the gate, he didn't have to kick it. He didn't have to shake it. He didn't have to try to find a key for it. The Bible says when he got in position, what was closed, I feel my help coming on me. What was no access granted? The Bible says when he got in the right place at the right time with revival in his heart, the Bible said that the door, the gate, opened on its own accord and the Lord told me to tell you that God is about to position you through revival you're going to stand in front of some doors that were closed and the enemy said you'd never walk through but the Holy Ghost told me to tell you you are about to get in front of the door and this time the door will not remain shut God is about to swing the city gate open to you here comes promotion here comes blessing here comes anointing are you ready to walk through the door exegetical expository preaching it says that now we have come through the gate but Pastor Troy won any gate it was the gate to the city and now the text makes sense that God gave revival to Peter because he wanted to bring awakening to the city Everything I just preached to you only works if it's for the city. If you go harbor your blessings and harbor your promotion and harbor your money and harbor your anointing, if you're going to take it all and just let it be for you, God ain't going to send revival to you. But if you ever make up your mind that everything God gives me is for my neighbors, it's for my unsaved boss. It's for the people I'm around. It's for the people in my neighborhood. If you ever make up your mind, God, use me. If you can use anything, Lord, use me. If you ever make up your mind to start ministries that's going to be kingdom and start businesses that affect the world for God's kingdom, then, 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 God. Real soft. Then God will give you revival. So I titled the message give me revival but give us I have wept more for cities in the last six months than I have in my whole ministry you do know Jesus only ever wept over two things the Bible says he wept over people and he wept over cities. He wept over Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem. He weeps over people and cities. Why? Because he wants revival for you, and he wants awakening for our city. Slip up your hands in this room. I feel the glory of the Lord. This is the moment where revival either comes or it's hindered. It's in the space where you'd say, all that stuff, God, I want you to do through me. When you can link it to God, do it through me for somebody else. Revival comes. I want you to begin to open up your mouth and say, God, give me revival. Come on, all across this room. All across this room as the singers come. 
Oh, come on, open up your mouth. God, give me revival. If you want revival, where are the men of God in this room? Where are the dads? Uh, where are the grandfathers who say, come on, ask for me in my house. Uh, we want revival. I'm going to lead my family through prayer, through worship. God, give us revival. Where are the women of God at who say, God, give me revival. You've been travailing. Some of you have been praying for revival for years and years and years. There has to be a collective cry from the church that says, God, give me revival. Come on, take 30 seconds. Just give me revival, Lord. Give me revival. Give me revival. Give me revival. Let's not perish. God, if the wind is blowing, don't let it pass me by. Lord, whatever you're doing in Kentucky, do it in Orlando. Whatever you're doing in Kentucky, do it in me. Send me revival. Now, transition your prayer. There is a city out there who is waiting for you to wake up. They will never hear their knocking until you hear yours. But for every person in this room who says, God, save our city. Save America. Save America, Lord. Save my family, save my husband. I want you to think about the people in your life who are about to be affected by your personal revival. And I want you to take 30 seconds and let's go into an all-out prayer meeting for 60 seconds. And let's just begin to pray right now for every lost person we know. Come on, pray for them. Pray for them like you were praying, for, like you would pray for you or want somebody to pray for you. Come on, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Give me revival, Lord. Give us awakening. 